What is pressure? Pressure is the measure of how much force is applied over a given area. And the formula for pressure is pressure is equal to force in newtons divided by the area the force is applied. And the units of pressure are newtons per metre squared, or pascals. But let's try and visualise this a bit better with an example. So we have two metal blocks here that are made of the same material and have the same dimensions. So in other words, they have the same mass. One of these blocks is at rest on its side and the other is at rest on one of its ends. If the dimensions of these blocks are 0.25 metres by 0.05 metres and 0.05 metres, which block out of these two separate blocks here is exerting the highest pressure on the surface it's resting on? And with our formula above, what is this pressure in pascals? So all we're interested in is how much force is being applied over a given area. So if we know the mass of these blocks, we can calculate the gravitational force acting on these blocks. And remember this force is equal to their weight, which is their mass multiplied by the acceleration due to gravity. So their force value due to their weight is equal to 14.7 newtons. So we've got the force and we can add that into our equation, our pressure equation above. What about the area? Well, if we have a look at block A, this block is distributing this 14.7 newton force over an area of 0.013 meters squared. Now this is a larger area than the contact area of block B. So because the area is larger for block A, for the same force, the pressure will be lower according to our equation. So block A, the pressure is 14.7 newtons divided by 0.013 meters squared. And we get a pressure of 1,200 pascals to two significant figures. Block B has a pressure of 14.7 newtons divided by 0.0025 meters squared. Now this pressure is a lot higher because of the smaller area. And we get a pressure of 5,900 pascals to two significant figures. So the pressure of block B on the surface is nearly five times higher than that of block A, even though both blocks have the same mass. Now fluids can also exert pressure on surrounding surfaces, and the pressure within a fluid increases with depth. At sea level, the air pressure is around 1.01 times 10 to the 5 pascals, and this is typically called one atmosphere of pressure. As we move to higher elevations, this pressure drops quite quickly. And by around five kilometers or three miles above sea level, this pressure drops by around half. And we can see this from this diagram here. So on the x-axis, we have elevation, where at sea level, at zero meters, the pressure is at one atmosphere. But as we climb above the surface, the pressure quickly drops. So let's try another question. So let's imagine we have a person on a skiing trip and this person is riding up a lift to a mountain top. Now, as he's going up this mountain, his ears fail to pop. In other words, the pressure of the inner ear is higher than the pressure of the outside atmosphere. So there's a force acting on the eardrum from the inner ear pushing outwards. Now the radius of the eardrum is 0.40 centimetres. The pressure of the atmosphere drops from 1.010 times 10 to the 5 pascals at the bottom of the lift to 
998 times 10 to the 5 pascals at the top of the lift. We want to find out two things. What is the pressure difference between the inner and outer ear at the top of the mountain? And what is the magnitude of the net force on this person's eardrum? So with this question, the inner ear does not equalize with the outside pressure, which means that the air pressure behind the eardrum is higher than the outside of the eardrum. So in part A of this question, the difference in pressure between the inner and outer ear is simply the difference in air pressure between the bottom and the top of the lift. So P net, the net pressure difference, is equal to the pressure at the bottom minus the pressure at the top. And we get a difference in pressure of 1200, of 1200 pascals. And this pressure difference is typical when we're raising our elevation by about 150 meters or about 500 feet. So what about the magnitude of the net force on the eardrum? We know the force is acting on the back of the eardrum and pointing in this direction because the pressure is higher in the inner ear. We're also given the radius of a typical eardrum and we're going to have to make an assumption here. We're going to have to assume that an eardrum is perfectly circular. We know that the area of a circle can be found out by the equation pi radius squared. And therefore, to get the area that this pressure is applied over, all we need to do is to insert 4.0 times 10 to the minus 3 meters into the radius variable here. What we need to do is rearrange our pressure equation to make the force the subject of the equation. And we multiply both sides by the area of the eardrum. So the net force acting on the eardrum is equal to 1200 pascals multiplied by pi r squared. And we get a value, a net force of 6.0 times 10 to the minus 2 newtons. So another important idea we need to learn here is Pascal's principle. Pascal's principle states that when you apply pressure to a fluid, for example, water or air, and this fluid is fully enclosed within a container, that pressure is transmitted equally in all directions throughout the fluid and to the walls of the container. So what does this mean? How can we visualize this? So let's say we blow up a balloon and submerse it in a container of water. On one end of this container, we have a piston that allows us to apply a very large pressure to this container of water. As we attempt to compress this fluid with this piston, the pressure of the water in this sealed container increases. But this pressure will be equal wherever you are in this fluid. So all surfaces will experience the same pressure and the balloon will also shrink in volume. Because the pressure is acting equally on all parts of the outside of the balloon. Here we have a small piston on one side of a hydraulic lift and it has an area of 0 0.20 meters squared. Now on the other side of this hydraulic lift, we have a car that weighs 1.20 times 10 to the 4 newtons. And it sits above a larger piston. And the large piston has an area of 0 0.90 meters squared. So our goal here, using the help of Pascal's principle, is to find out how large a force must be applied to the small piston to support the car. This force, F1, causes a pressure increase in this fluid. And this fluid is enclosed within this container down here. 
According to Pascal's principle, any increase in the pressure is transmitted equally to every point of the fluid and to the walls of the container. So if we can work out the pressure on area 1 here, A1, we know that the pressure across A2 is going to be exactly the same due to Pascal's principle. So we don't know the force on F1, but we know the weight of the car. To keep the car stationary, we need F2 to have a magnitude that's equal to the weight of the car. So F2 is equal to 12,000 newtons also. So if we rearrange our equation here to give us F1, and we do this by multiplying both sides of the equation by area 1, and we plug in our values for our areas and the force F2, we get a final force of 2,700 newtons to two significant figures. So now we're going to talk about how pressure varies with depth within a fluid. In this question, we have a submarine that dives to a depth of 500 meters. And our goal is to work out how much pressure in pascals must its hull be able to withstand. And also, how many times larger is this pressure at 500 meters than the pressure at the surface? So before we get into answering this question, we need to formulate an equation for the fluid pressure as a function of depth. Now the fluid we're talking about here is water, but this will work for all fluids in a gravitational field. So as our submarine dives deeper in water, the pressure against the hull will increase. Now the reason why water pressure increases with depth is because the water molecules at a given depth must support the weight of all the water above it. So let's imagine we have a small area on the surface of the submarine. The weight of the entire column of water above this area exerts a force on this area, which we can find by calculating the mass of this column of water multiplied by the gravitational acceleration. Now first we need to find out the volume of this column of water, which is equal to the area of this bottom square here multiplied by the height of this column. And this gives us the volume of the column. We can rearrange the density equation, which we covered in a previous lesson. To get the mass component, we need the density of the seawater, which we'll get to in a minute, and the volume of this column, which is equal to the cross-sectional area multiplied by the depth or the height of the column. So now we have a formula for the mass of the column. But how can we find out the pressure on the surface of this submarine? Well, early in the video, I told you that pressure is equal to force divided by area. And we established just moments ago that the force exerted by this column of liquid is equal to its weight. We know the mass of this column of water is also equal to the density of water multiplied by the cross-sectional area of this column multiplied by the height of this column. So the force now is equal to the density of water multiplied by the cross-sectional area, the depth of the submarine multiplied by the gravitational acceleration. And because pressure is equal to force divided by area, we can now plug in this force term. So the pressure now equals this force term up here divided by the cross-sectional area. And the cross-sectional area now cancels out because it's in the numerator and denominator. So the pressure of any object at a depth of h increases linearly with the depth so long as our liquid's density, our fluid here, remains constant. Now this won't work with gases, because gases can be compressed, and we covered this in the last lesson.
But liquids like seawater are very hard to compress. But if you notice here on the graph, so we've only taken into account the weight of the column of water above the submarine. What about the weight of the column of air in the atmosphere from sea level up to the edge of the atmosphere? That also has a weight. And so you need to add that to the pressure that the submarine experiences. So this pressure here is called the gauge pressure. The total pressure or absolute pressure on the submarine is equal to this gauge pressure plus the atmospheric pressure at sea level. And this gives us our final equation for the pressure. So let's answer this question in full. So the total pressure or absolute pressure at 500 meters is equal to the atmospheric pressure plus the density of water which is 1.025 times 10 to the times 10 to the 3 kilograms per meter cubed multiplied by the acceleration due to gravity and then finally multiplied by the depth of the submarine 500 meters we get a final pressure of 5.1 million pascals so how much larger is this pressure compared to the pressure of the submarine when it's surfaced? All we need to do is divide the pressure at depth, 5.1 million pascals, by atmospheric pressure. And we get a pressure increase of 50 times that of atmospheric pressure. So let's summarise what we've covered here today in this lesson. So we started off by defining pressure, which is a measure of how much force is applied over a given area. Pressure is equal to force divided by area. And we covered two real life example questions to demonstrate how pressure can vary in different circumstances. Pressure is not just about the weight of an object or the force applied on a surface. The area that the force is applied over is also very important here. Next, we looked at how air pressure varies with height and how to calculate the force if you raise your elevation 100 or so meters and your ears fail to pop. Next, we defined Pascal's principle and used this to help us answer a question on hydraulics. For example, being able to lift up a heavy object such as a car with a small amount of force. Then we looked at how to calculate the total pressure on a submarine's hull and how this pressure varies with depth within a non-compressible fluid and it has to be non-compressible.